Harvard Divinity School. Virtual Colloquium on Gender Dynamics in Intentional Communities, April 27th, 2021. Hello and welcome to today's virtual colloquium on gender dynamics and intentional communities. My name is Dan McKinnon. I am joining you from Somerville on the unceded lands of the Massachusetts people and the watershed of the Charles River. I have the pleasure of serving as the founding director of Harvard's program for the evolution of spirituality. I'll say just a word about our program and this colloquium series before passing the mic to today's moderator. The program for the evolution of spirituality aims to support the scholarly study of emerging spiritual movements, marginalized spiritualities, and the innovative edges of established spiritual traditions. We seek to build a scholarly community that fully includes practitioners of alternative spiritualities and critics of those spiritualities as well as those who take a neutral scholarly approach. We hope that all of you will be able to join us either virtually or in person when we gather for our inaugural conference on ecological spiritualities, April 27th through 30th, 2022. And you just saw a little more information about that event. It's also available on the web uh, if you just Google HDS Program for the Evolution of Spirituality. Today's session is part of a monthly series of events digging deeply into power dynamics in alternative spiritualities and communities. We hope these conversations will highlight diverse individual experiences and diverse approaches to the abuses and dynamics of power in, an, in a manner that invites everyone to think more deeply. Our two guests will be in conversation for the next hour after which we will have 20 minutes for questions from all of you. And now it is my deep pleasure to welcome our Assistant Program Director, Natalia Schween, uh, who has been the guiding spirit behind, behind this series and who will be moderating today's conversation. Natalia. Thank you so much, Dan, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Natalia, and as Dan said, I am the Assistant Program Director for the Program for the Evolution of Spirituality at HDS, joining you from Cambridge, Massachusetts, the traditional homelands of the Massachusetts people. Today's conversation marks the fourth iteration in our series on abuse of power, and we'll be shifting our focus slightly to discuss gender dynamics in intentional communities. Many of the spaces our two panelists have studied aspire to do family and sexuality in a better way than in mainstream society, but the reality does not always conform to this ideal. So our question today is, what happens when an intentional community articulates ideals that it is not able to fully realize in its practice? We are so thrilled to have that. To, uh, we are so thrilled that our two speakers today have agreed to join us and to share our share their expertise. So, without further further ado, ado, please meet Dr. Maria Burschel. She is a German sociologist and professor for social work at the IU International University. She worked as a social researcher for several projects at the German Youth Institute in Munich. Her focus lies in family research, divorce and separation, gender, community building, sustainability, and transformation. In her doctoral thesis, she analyzed the doing of separation between parents and intentional communities as an indicator for social sustainability. And our second speaker, Crystal Bird Farmer, is an engineer turned educator, organizer, and speaker who focuses on co housing, Black and polyamorous communities. She serves as a board member for the Foundation for Interna Intentional Communities and is passionate about encouraging people to change their perspectives on diversity, relationships, and the world. Um, and to frame the conversation, I would like to begin by inviting our speakers to share a little bit more about their work and about the specific intentional communities which they have studied. We'll begin with Maria and then move on to Crystal. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah, um, I conducted uh, interviews with parents who had separated in intentional communities. And I visited four intentional communities in Germany, 
all were situated in rural areas in small villages. Um, all were um, between five and over 40 years old, so not in an early founding phase, but already established. They all had a, a structured admission procedure, for example, and uh, organizational structures. Um, they all had ecological agri agriculture. Um, they did community building after Scott Peck and uh, non-violent communication after Marshall Rosenberg. Um, maybe I should say a few words about the non-violent communication. It's a form of communication, like a technique to increase peace and empathy and to um, in, when, when, when conflict arises or when uh, communication becomes difficult, it advises people to distinguish between observation and uh, evaluation or judgment and stick to the ob observation to the facts, to distinguish between uh, feelings and uh, thoughts and stories around it and just talk about your, yourself and your own feelings, what you feel at this moment. Uh, you should talk about your needs. They think, also the the um, the underlying assumption is that there are universal needs, and uh, you should distinguish these needs from strategies which might cause conflict, and also to distinguish between request and demand. You should not uh, express a demand because this will cause a reaction and a no, and if you um, uh, express a request, you have a much better sh chance that the other person might uh, take, uh, might empathize with you, take your perspective, and but still has the opportunity to say yes or no. So this is important for my research, <clears throat> these postulates of the uh, uh, non-violent communication. And I also want to say that each of the four intentional communities that I visited had a, spe a specific focus, which uh, formed the, sp the specific character of the community. So one was basically about exploring new forms of partnership, uh, sexuality and love. Uh, one was more about the community building and sociocracy. One had a strong focus on ecological building, water cycles and architecture. And one was based on a jointly operated gastronomy event location. So that was which really shaped these intentional communities. But all, all of them considered themselves to be pilots for a new socially innov innovative and sustainable way of living. Thank you, Maria. And Crystal, I'll pass the mic over to you. Hi. Um... So I am a um, diversity consultant and somebody who has worked with intentional communities for the past few years now. So my experiences in community have been as a participant and as an observer and then as a trainer. Um, specifically for this chat, we're gonna be talking about um, new culture communities, which are an offshoot of communities that were started in Germany by Dieter Doom. Um, and focus on um, kind of radical relationship building and sexuality. Um, so I was a part of that work in the US and then I've been a visitor to many intentional communities in the US and to give a definition of intentional communities, these are usually residential communities where people gather around shared values and shared ideals um, for changing the world. So a lot of people think of kind of the 60s and, and communes that come up. And so communes were are, are communities that share income and share all the expenses in common. Nowadays, there are lots of different types of communities. So along with communes, we have housing co-ops and then we have co-housing communities, which um, focus more on private ownership and private um, income sources, but are still kind of built around those values of of sharing um, location and sharing values with each other. Um, so thank you so much, Crystal and Maria for sharing more. And I'm curious, what ideals have you found in these communities that the ideals that they particularly seek with regards to family, sexuality, gender in, and inclusivity? Uh, Maria, we'll begin with you again. 
So, um, yeah, as a sociologist and family researcher, I was especially interested in the ideals of family life and partnership in intentional communities. So, um, in general, uh, in intentional community, there's a general openness towards alternative forms of family. The borders of the core family are much are open and they merge with the community. So there's a there's there's it's permeable family and community, and uh, they merge with each other. And also privacy. It's there's not this very strict private space in intentional communities, which is a very interesting um, because it's a new concept of family. And with partnership, it's uh, also um, very interesting because they really uh, uh, focus on something or they, they value something which is, which is called a pure relationship. Anthony Giddens came up with this phrase in the 1990s and it means you see partnership as something based on voluntariliness, on mutuality. Uh, there's a balance of power. There's no dependencies, a love, authenticity, and also therefore there's an openness towards open relationships and polyamory, which does not mean that they all live that way, uh, but it's a general openness towards alternative ways of living. And um, it's not only abstract, but people really reflect on these values. They practice it. They do a lot of emotional work. Uh, they call it peace work, it's spiritual work. It's, it's about spiritually growing uh, with a non-violent communication and so on. And I really wanted to kind of study separation, the way parents separate under the microscope in this field with this awareness of um, uh, of, the, of the values of this pure relationship. And I wanted to know how they distribute paid and unpaid work, how they establish uh, uh, like um, equality, how they create equal footing, or if they do that, and how they communicate, how do they solve problems in a partnership with children that was my, that was important to me. And um, how do they co-parent after separation? How, because it's all very difficult and um, there's lots of potential for conflict. Yeah, so um, the first thing I wanna point out is that it might be um, kind of funny for people who are part of new culture movements or communities to, to be talked about in a, you know, in a context of religion and spirituality. But the reality is that um, you know, new culture does kind of come with some um, philosophy towards spirituality and toward how to live in relationship with others and with the world. Um, there's no specific religion that new culture people follow, um, you know, but there is a tendency towards progressive uh, spiritualities that, um, that are here in the US. So some of new culture's other, um, I would say their main, um, tenant and their main focus is radical relationship building and communication. So new culture is very interested in the way that we relate to each other. And I think Dieter Doom especially saw that the, the, the things of the material world and capitalism were kind of preventing us from having deep relationships. And so new culture is all about cultivating those deep relationships it's about radical communication, which is done through what's called the ZEG forum, um, forum. And then also, they also use nonviolent communication. Um, and, you know, also being open to alternative sexualities and alternative ways of relating. So polyamory and non-monogamy are also present in new culture communities. Um, I'll go back a little bit to describe what ZEG is. Um, Z-E-G-G -G is a, a in a discipline or, or a way of, of talking about community issues that helps everyone become clear on where people are with regards to a certain event or how they're feeling in community and their relationship to community. And it's seen as a, it's a very different style of communication than what typical Americans are used to as far as when they're in conflict with each other. And so that is kind of helping with new cultures 
stance toward being radically honest and vulnerable and, and being willing to, to talk to each other on a deeper level than just the surface level. Um, you know, ecological stewardship is also important to new culture communities. And so being gentle with the earth and having values such as being vegan or um, vegetarian and, and being able, being supportive of um, environmental efforts is another part of new cultures philosophy. Thank you. That's really interesting. And it's so interesting, the focus on relationship that the two of you have uh, looked at in these intentional communities. That feeds into our next question, um, which I'm going to turn to Crystal first about, which is that much of your work has been to support and educate communities after they have identified problems or imbalance in their structure. So could you speak with us a little bit about some of the ways in which these communities sometimes um, struggle with these goals or fail to reach these goals or recognize an issue within their own structure and attempt to address that imbalance? Yeah, so because new culture is focused so much on um, deep relationships and communication, um, people can feel like they're really getting deep on issues and addressing things. Um, but when there's an outside perspective, you know, there may be things that they're kind of glossing over because they have shared cultural values. So some of the work that I've done um, writing about new culture is to criticize the, um, the way that new culture handles diversity, especially racial diversity and gender diversity. So new culture, you know, of course, was kind of started by older white people and you know that kind of carries that middle class upper class american ethos of um, individuality and um, kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps that kind of culture and so um, when people created kind of the systems and the the ways that new culture people work together they weren't always considerate of lower class people of gender minorities like trans and binary non-binary people and then of racial minorities and and socioeconomic differences so when those people engage with new culture it's kind of like walking like walking on to harvard and and not even having you know a high school education where there's so much going on um, you know, intellectually and especially about the communication and, and how people are relating to each other, that it's difficult to connect and understand how can you feel like you're a part of this organization that really is built on belonging and everybody, you know, being in relationship with each other. Um, and so some of those things are just because of the assumptions about people's differences and you know, one of the things that happens in a lot of organizations that are progressive is kind of like this um, color blindness, where if you think um, we love everybody, we treat everybody at the heart level, you know, we're, we're really connecting with them. And that that makes all the other things not important. That means that, you know, we're dealing with them as a person, not as a black person. Um, but in reality, people are bringing all of their traumas, all of their identities, all of their selves to a new culture event or to a community. And that means that those things will block the relationships or will change the way that people communicate with each other. So it's in um, my observation that when those things pop up in community, you know, they can kind of be dealt with in the, the regular cycle of a ZEG forum or in a communication with nonviolent communication. But what's missing is kind of this meta analysis of what as a community are we doing to recognize these marginalized people and, and the ways that they're not feeling supported in community. And so in the time that I've worked with new culture people and been a part of the communities, I've seen them kind of recognize that and acknowledge that and start working with that to, to change just the culture that is a part of new culture. Thank you, Crystal. Maria, I'm curious, your um, experience has been in a, in specifically in Germany, which obviously has a slightly different context. I'm curious, has your experience been similar? Have your findings around uh, some of the struggles to reach those ideals or to live up to those ideals? Um, if you could speak a little bit about how those communities have adjusted, that would be, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I would I would like to give you an insight into my my findings. Um, uh, so even though uh, there is this openness towards alternative forms of living and family, 
I found that, and also the people that I interviewed, they actually all lived quite traditionally considering the division of, of work. So uh, the care work being done by the mother and the uh, breadwinning was done by the father, even if they maybe had open forms of relationship or something like that, they still kind of stuck to this concept. And we all know that this concept bears Im imbalances, but these imbalances were kind of not problematized. Um, until the moment, I mean, there is maybe there is no problem if couples stay together, the problems never arise, but they will arise eventually when separation happens. And I spoke to separated parents, and normally there's conflict uh, after these when there are when there were imbalances in the relationship before, but not so much here. And I was wondering, they were all quite happy with their separation, the way it went, and with the uh, parenting after separation. And I was wondering why is that. And I found that they have a very specific uh, concept of motherhood and conflict in itself. And this, on the one hand, prevented conflict and prevented like very difficult separations, but had very problematic aspects as well. And if I would like to explain that a little bit. So motherhood uh, was really seen as uh, mothers wanted to be mothers, full-time mothers. It was seen as something very healing, for themselves, for the child, for the world. It was seen as something very like mature to be a mother is almost like a, a higher stage of, of, of personhood, uh, forgiving, giving, taking yourself back, putting other people first. All this was seen as something very good and feminine and what mothers do and natural there's, there's always this biological explanation with it so as if it's it's this is the meant the way it's meant to be to, to be and that's why it's the best and also which i find very interesting it's seen as something rebellious it's like resisting the mainstream pressure to go to work as a, as a as a mother and give your kid to long hours of daycare so they even felt like they're doing something feminist by staying at being a, being a full-time mother basically and conflict was seen as a way to grow yeah it's not about okay two people want different things and we need to somehow come together and find common grounds but actually it's it's inside of me i'm fully responsible for all my feelings i take them to myself nobody is to blame from the outside world no structure nothing it's all inside of me i never blame others uh, they never consider themselves as victims that is really frowned upon if you if you have this victim mentality and um, according to the nonviolent communication, they don't express demands. And that here is the link to something which I would really call emotional abuse in, in partnerships in, during the course of separation, because it becomes really, really difficult if you can't demand something and if you cannot point out power dynamics to point out po power dynamics is impossible. And uh, this leads to um, something, uh, uh, so the, the mothers always blamed themselves. So they took all the blame to themselves, even if they had a really horrible uh, separation, really traumatic, especially when the separation happened uh, around birth, when mothers were really in a very vulnerable situation or with very small children. And for example, I could tell you the stories, but I don't want, <laughs> want to go into it too much. And they still blamed themselves for being angry, for being frustrated, for demanding more support, for demanding change. Yeah, if, they, if they said to the father, you have to be here more, you have to support me more. They were really completely confused. They didn't expect that. And that led to self-blame. They put themselves doubt, uh, down. They doubted their feelings. They felt they felt the wrong way. They should feel differently. And they... Um, took the man's, the father's perspective. So this is even, this is a little bit like trauma bonding. And um, I don't want to diagnose anything here. I'm not a psychologist, but you have to consider if you, if you, if you practice uh, nonviolent communication that there are different personality types. Some people are really good at empathizing with, with others. Some people are not. Some people cannot do that. Is If you look at the narcissistic spectrum or a psychopathic 
spectrum of uh, character traits, these people are not able to do that. And then the nonviolent communication becomes really toxic. Yeah, following on that a little bit, um, yeah. in new culture communities, there is also kind of this idea of owning your feelings and owning mm -hmm. what's happening to you. And that yeah. can definitely create the toxic atmosphere of not being able to ask for support because, yeah. you know, when somebody like experiences a microaggression, the, sometimes the idea is that, oh, you were opening yourself up to experience. Yeah. You know, it's not a systemic thing, it's a personal thing and you yeah. have to work around your reactivity around that. And so that's definitely part of the, one of the failings of, of the, the way that new culture has been set up. And I think some intentional communities use nonviolent communication as a way to, uh, not take responsibility for for their actions yes and if i if i may add this if you look at gender dynamics i find um that there's a high risk of traditional hegemonic masculine structures being solidified by the postulates of the non nonviolent communication because if everything is your, it's, it's all inside of you, nothing is, nothing from the outside affects you, then it stays like that. Yeah, it's, it's not going to change. And uh, with all these words like authenticity and love and mutuality, they also abstract and they might mean different things to different people and to the genders, of, of course, it means something different. And um, it, it, it even allows... Um, people who consider themselves to be male to show themselves vulnerable and emotional and and modern they talk about feelings and and that you were so aggressive that that hurt me so much so they show themselves vulnerable but actually solidify the hegemonic masculinity but in a covert way and that makes it so tricky to detect Thank you, Maria and Crystal. And before we move on to the next question, Maria, you also mentioned the uh, the payment structure. Um, just really quickly, I wanted to touch on that within uh, the difficulty where you were finding in your research that um, male members of the community were being paid for their uh, for their work or were allowed to have uh, jobs outside of the communities, whereas the uh, the um, mothers, people who are identifying as mothers, were um, they, they were not paid in the same uh, way, or they were working full time jobs, but that wasn't part of uh, part of the payment mm -hmm. structure, and was it assisting in creating an imbalance? Um, well, no, I I don't know if 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 I understand if she, uh, what I meant is they did the the traditional thing. The 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 father went out and did the breadwinning. They they had a, he had a job, a paid job. And mother did the care work, the family work. And of course, that's a full-time job, but it's not paid for. And there's an obvious imbalance. Yeah, of course, in the moment you separate, one person has money, the other one doesn't. So, so and this is not looked at. There's a gender blind spot and they don't look at creating um, a common, uh, like what's it called, uh, uh, equal footing for both. So they, they are very focused on emo emotional growth and development, but not so much on the practical work. So who's doing what? Are, this, are people, you know, on the same level? Are they, do they have equal, equal footing? That's what I meant. Yeah, no, that's really mm -hmm. helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that leads us perfectly into our next question, which mm -hmm. I'll also turn to Crystal first for. Um, and the question is, in our meetings together, we've talked about restructuring rather than dismantling once problems have been identified. And a big part of your work, as well as Maria's work, has been to encourage work, or especially your work, Crystal, has been to encourage growth and transformation rather than to completely dismantle because the problem has been identified. Um, so based on your research, what advice would you give to intentional communities going forward as they're looking at power dynamics, as they're examining abuse of power, as they're examining power roles within the community, um, what would your advice be going forward? Yeah, so the, the work that I do with communities and the advice that I give them is to, you know, step back and, and take a look at those dynamics and understand, you know, um, when it comes to race, you know, a lot of communities don't have a huge number of people with minority races. And so, 
you know, there is a need for them to understand more about that experience. And, you know, the easiest way to do that is through books or movies. Um, and there's also ways that you can kind of get feedback from people in the community that helps others to understand what's going on, but isn't kind of traumatizing people to have to tell kind of negative experiences. But when it comes to gender, you know, um, what I found has been similar to Maria is that, you know, they are very progressive and, and think that they're doing a lot around gender, but there's still very traditional roles that are defined. And I think one thing that communities can do is look at how they value kind of the soft skills of emotional work and communication versus the hard skills of building a community or, you know, milking the cows and, and building the machines and things like that. And and understand how they're seeing how that work is valued. So, you know, there are lots of communities that try and create an equitable way of, um, of counting labor. And so it's important to think if people are building in assumptions that, oh, this is, you know, somebody sitting at a desk for two hours. And so maybe it's not as valuable as somebody working in the garden for two hours. And especially when it comes to childcare, you know, well, we're gonna have a certain set of people do the childcare, but those people may not be able to participate in community meetings or you know, community meals because they're always taking care of the kids. So finding ways to, um, to value that work regardless of who's doing it and then kind of analyzing, are we making assumptions about what kind of body can do that work and what kind of body is best for doing that work? Um, so the advice I would give them is, um the question right um yeah F first of all i feel the need to say that i found six types of separation and i'm i'm here talking about two types with this uh with this um risk of emotional abuse i want to point out that there's all sorts of things also in intentional communities but especially this uh this one i could find in this atmosphere of the Nonviolent communication. So just to not not to create the impression that it's all like this. But in general, I would give uh, like to give the advice to intentional communities to really look at their blind spots and to focus less on emotional and spiritual growth and more on who's who's doing what on on, on creating equal opportunities, on really reflecting on traditional gender roles um, and to reflect on social sustainability because that is what they want to achieve they want to, be, to achieve sustainable living new for, like new uh, forms of living uh, which create less pollution and less injustice and they have to not only consider ecological and economical sustainability but also social sustainability and i don't think that there's a clear definition of what that actually means there are a few German sociologist uh, Matthias Grundmann and um, Iris Kunze who worked around that and suggested something like everything you do should f should create a connection between people and that could be something which could be a measurement for uh, social sustainability and I would like to add uh, everything we should we do should create equal opportunities for people and um, that could be a measurement for social sustainability. Um, yeah, I think that's the main thing that I would advise them. Thank you, Maria and Crystal. That was really helpful and really interesting. And we will provide some resources that uh, Crystal has sent over to us at the end of the session today. And um, so before we get into our Q&A with our audience, we'll explore a few more questions that came up during our conversations together. And either of you, Crystal and Maria, please feel free to jump in if you would like to respond. Uh, we'll begin with, how does the transient nature of some of these communities make it more or less difficult to maintain accountability in power, around power dynamics? Do you have any advice on how this could be adjusted or regulated or structured in a way that helps to address some of the imbalances that both of you have studied in these communities? Yeah, what I, maybe I, I start. What I found in the communities is, uh, I mean, I, I was studying sep separation of parents, 
that it was really helpful for many mothers, especially to be in the community when they separated because they really felt looked after. I mean, that says a lot of our mainstream society. They really felt that they, there is a container that can carry them through this difficult time of separation. Um, they felt they had a human connection. They had friends. They had people to turn to. Uh, they could find new partners um, and they could find new new alternative families if they shared big flats or something like that, lived to, with together with people and they created something that feels like family you know even if nobody was really related but it feels like it and um, on the other hand there is this fluctuation in intentional communities people come and go that doesn't mean that there's not a core there's a core of people who live there for 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 decades but there's a lot of coming and going some people stay for uh, just for a internship maybe some for a few years and then they leave and that of course creates uh, instability and I think there's also reflection needed uh, on this aspect also if you can if you look at uh, a child development how is it for children if they bond with people and find friends and then they go and there's this coming and going uh, I, I just think this is something they that, that should be looked at Okay, yeah, um, what I've seen in intentional communities is, is kind of similar to what I saw when I worked as an engineer. You know, there's kind of like the, the formal policy, the written rules that you follow, and then there's kind of like the hidden policies or hidden procedures that everybody actually does. And when you're in an intentional community, I think it's really important to document you know, the decisions that you've made and why you made those decisions and then, you know, how they're exactly supposed to work. Because when you do have people moving on, people getting old, people dying, um, you know, it, it's hard to keep that culture or keep that understanding through, especially if it's like a 50 year old community, you know, there's only going to be a, a couple people who were there at the founding that are still there 50 years later. So I think when it comes to um, kind of creating some accountability. It just needs to be documentation for how do we go through these processes? What kind of incidents have we had before and, and what did we do and what worked with what we did and what didn't work with what we did? I, I would like to add something here, if I may, um, uh, about, again, about separation. Uh, sometimes I uh, had the impression that for fathers, it was a bit like they felt they in, in during the separation process they felt good about le basically leaving mother and child in the safe hands of the community and then going off so it even was a, a means for fathers to feel good to feel as, to, to to present themselves as good and responsible fathers but actually they were left off the hook and they didn't again um take the responsibility of the family work and the, 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 re, the work on relationship and bringing up a child. It's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, well, both of you actually have spoken mm -hmm. about foundational myths in these spaces, especially with regards to how leadership is determined. And Crystal, you just brought that up. And I'm really curious, especially with some of what Maria is saying. Um, could you speak a bit more about how these stories, how the foundation myths of intentional communities affect gender dynamics in the spaces you've studied and how they either support or complicate accountability in group dynamics? And this might also be a good point for um, either of you after Crystal addresses this question um, if, to, to note the role of any charismatic leaders if you've encountered them in intentional communities and how that fits within uh, foundational myths for these spaces. Yeah, so the, the cycle of creating an intentional community is, is roughly the same for, um, for different types of communities. You know, they, they start out with some small group that has shared ideals and, and wants to implement the work. Um, but when it comes to the type of work that is done, there's definitely differences in which genders take on which roles. And so you may see the men kind of being seen as the figurehead, as the leader, as kind of like the, um, the visionary, but it's women who are usually doing a lot of that, those soft skills again, a lot of that connecting, you know, they're organizing potlucks, they're 
you know, organizing book clubs, they're um, helping people to, to find them and to communicate with them about what the community is about. And then you have the, the men who are doing roles like, you know, finding architects, the men are architects, um, doing the actual construction and building are going to be mostly male bodies. Um, and so that is something that kind of gets overlooked when people are building communities, but it's just like when you see a forming community, which means a community that hasn't moved in yet, you know, your first interaction is probably going to be with the women of the community. And especially when it comes to seekers of community, it's more often the wife of a, you know, a heterosexual couple that is looking for a community and then they're trying to convince their husband that this is a good idea. Um, but then when you get into community, the, the leaders, the people who are seen as like the influential people are going to be male. Um, you know, just because we have that kind of expectation that men are strong and dominant and, and all of those types of things. Um, when it comes to charismatic leaders, there there's definitely been a lot of communities that have charismatic leaders um, and New Culture has had that as well. I mean, Dieter Doom himself was kind of like a very charismatic person. Um, and so, you know, these people exert a lot of influence on what happens in the community. And when it comes to accountability, sometimes that influence um, prevents there from being accountability, especially if, if something, uh, if there's somebody who's doing harm and they're closely aligned with the leaders and that person is not gonna be held as accountable as somebody who's kind of in the out group or just a general member of the community. So that's definitely been a problem in several communities that I've seen where you have people in power who are kind of protecting the status quo and when that status quo is causing harm, you know, you might have people who are interacting with the community, they get harm and they leave because they don't see a way that they can change what is happening in that community because they don't have that power. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's so interesting. Maria, do you have anything that you'd like to add in response uh, to this? Um, no, I find it really very interesting and I completely agree. I, I didn't study that, but my impression was the same. And also I found that if women have a leading role, it's mostly elderly women or older women. They're like women with children, the mothers, they are a different thing somehow. It's uh, it, but that's my impression. I didn't really study that, but that's what I saw. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a lot about motherhood and how the idea of motherhood kind of becomes a third category of personhood in these communities, almost as if the role is another gender or a gender in and of itself. Um, and so could you please speak a little to how you see this play out and how does this dynamic shift within a community which is inclusive of trans and non-binary people or if it shifts at all? I think this 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 idea of motherhood um, being give as being completely you know it's not about myself it's all about giving 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 being there for others taking responsibility for others making it all nice for others and this this is it's not only motherhood it's also connected of course with femininity and so it's it's uh, it, and it, it's happening in families so the place where socialization happens where children learn the gender roles, this is gender stereotypes, and it is, um, this is what, what is lived very much also in intentional communities. And um, it leads to, for example, many fathers that I interviewed said to me, they feel left out in the family, they feel unimportant, uh, especially when the children are little or babies. They feel it's, um, their, it's their role to keep this family kind of safe and to earn the money. But they, as a person with emotions, with the ability to, for, to bond with people, with, with a child, they feel unimportant and even not important. And they become more important once the kid is a bit older and then they could go cycling and climbing and in the woods and do this, the man things, yeah. So extremely traditional, very traditional. So uh, I found that really interesting and, but they're not aware of it, they, they think, or, or the way it is, um, it is talked about, the concept is, this is how it sh should be, this is good, and this is natural. Yeah, so in my experience with new cultures specifically, you know, the, the ideas of around motherhood and parenthood, and then the inclusion of 
non-traditional, non-conforming genders, um, you know, is very difficult for people to adjust to because they are kind of raised in that middle-class white culture where, you know, maybe the mom stayed home while the dad worked, you know, the, um, the women did a lot of the cooking and organizing and things like that. And so when it turns into a residential community, that work carries on and the children of that community are kind of brought into those same ideals without being challenged. Since new culture is most, most of new culture is not residential communities, meaning people are, are coming to an event um, to, to live in a kind of a temporary space. Um, you know, it, there wasn't a lot of space for families, you know, there was um, some provision, you know, if you wanted to bring your kid, but your kid also had to have a, a measure of independence and ability to take care of themselves while they were at the event. Um, you know, when I was there, they hired a babysitter or a nanny, you know, who could help with that, but that person only worked during the daytime hours, meaning if, um, you know, parents wanted to participate in like more of the sexuality activities that happened later at night, you know, they had to get somebody to watch their kid or, you know, they had to stay home. Um, so there was definitely this kind of distinction between a woman, you know, who can participate fully in new culture and a mother who, you know, kind of has to worry about, you know, um, what is my kid being exposed to? Who's taking care of my kid? Is my kid wandering off in the woods and, you know, things like that, that are just kind of traditional, you know, associated with being a mother. But when you have a, um, a temporary kind of residential camp and people can come and kind of be free of, of society structures, the one thing that remains is kind of your, your motherhood and your, your parent and whether you um, have a child you have to take care of. Oh, and then when it comes to trans and non-binary people, you know, it's, um, it was definitely a challenge for new culture, as I saw it, to integrate those people into community. Um, you know, just because, again, people grow up having an experience of gender and expectations around that. And then, you know, there was a lot of safety issues, trust issues when it came to people who were gender non-conforming because it's like, I'm expecting you to to do a certain thing or to be a certain thing. And, you know, maybe that person wasn't meeting those expectations, which again, you know, new culture would try and deal with through ZEG and through nonviolent communication, but was really about a culturally kind of held belief about what male and female bodies do. And so um, there was definitely some challenges in, in kind of pushing away some of those traditional thoughts about gender and being accepting to how people presented themselves and how they wanted to be addressed. Thank you. It's so interesting. So um, our last question before we move on to our, um, our Q&A with our audience is we talked about how emotional training and intellectual training around structural racism and structural patriarchal norms plays out in these communities. Um, essentially how we don't function as autonomous, unaffected individuals, individual agents just moving through the world that we are always affected by the structures which are in play, the larger structures that are in play beyond our community. Um, and so I'm wondering, could you speak to how training does or does not play a role in the communities you've encountered? And by training, I mean, is there an, an part of an initiation process or an onboarding process where uh, structural racism, structural patriarchy is discussed where people start to try to, uh, to look at how it could be undone or dismantled within their community, how to support those from marginalized groups who are joining the community. Um, and if it has, if that even has happened in the, in the spaces that you've studied and if it has not, how could communities um, ad uh, ad adjust their process um, or even adjust their trainings every year, their meetings every year in order to, um, to look at how these imbalances are affecting the health and social sustainability within their community. Yeah, I'll say the reason I have a job is because communities haven't addressed these things. Um, you know, whether it's been a community for 50 years or it's a forming community, you know, sometimes those ideas about diversity um, and structural racism are, are only considered when they realize they don't have diversity. Um, so 
there's definitely a need for people to recognize that there's a problem and then to um, somehow address that problem. And training is kind of like the first step to that, to get everybody on the same page. And I've definitely seen a resistance to that training. Um, in new culture, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on the sexuality and the spirituality and the personal work. And so that means when you're asking people to do work around kind of like structural things, it's like there's some pushback because, you know, that's not something we can affect or that's something that's in the outside world. And so there was a lot of resistance to to doing this work and to, to thinking about how um, marginalized groups show up in new culture spaces. Um, yeah, and so, so most communities don't do any kind of training, but you know, some kind of yearly training or just some kind of guidelines for people to, to read and to, to think about when they enter a community is really helpful for helping, you know, kind of the, the majority population or white people or, you know, to understand what other people might be going through, but also for marginalized people to come into a situation and say, okay, I see that they have some type of training. So I know that at least some of my needs will be attended. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I made the same observations. Also in Germany, it's basically white people, white middle class people, academics. Um, and of course, they carry this habitus with them, that this culture. And um, I completely agree. They don't really look at structure and socialization. And all this is, 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 is not their focus. It's, it's this uh, concept that everything's happening inside of me and that I'm responsible for, for everything. And this is, I think, a very dangerous concept. Um, thank you all. Thank you to our attendees for joining us. We have about 20 minutes, a little bit more, um, to ask or to respond to questions from the audience. So our first question is from Helen, uh, which is, do any of the communities that either of you have studied include the elderly? And Crystal, you did talk a little bit about this in, in foundational myths um, and looking at leaders within, within communities. And are the communities you've studied prepared to have older members? And if not, what does that say about the community? Yeah, so, you know, there's kind of this cycle of a community and, you know, a lot of communities are founded by um, young, excited people with families, especially in the 60s, you know, a lot of kind of the long-term communities in the U.S. have, you know, experienced whole generation and they find that those communities did not prepare for people to be old and not to, not being able to you know walk around and work in the garden or you know fix the roof or whatever and so you know when that happens the community thinks okay now we need young families we need more people in and then they you know they kind of repeat the cycle of you know we didn't plan for this so now we have to put more work in to get those types of people um, so yeah there is this concept now of aging in place and so a lot mm -hmm. of forming communities are trying to focus specifically on, you know, what happens when we get older and we need more support, you know, communities, intentional communities do not want to become a nursing home, you know, they want to be someplace where people are active and, and involved in the community from start to finish. And so that means making kind of plans for adjusting to people at their end of life. And so if that means not having a lot of two level buildings, you know, having less stairs or having paths that are navigatable by um, wheelchairs or walkers, um, having enough people and different ages of people that when the when these people get older, these younger people will still be able to kind of take on some of that physical labor. Those are considerations that forming communities are trying to include now that they're now that they know. Maria, has your experience been similar? Yes. Absolutely, yeah. So they, they, they're, they're coming up with this problem, they're seeing it and they're addressing it. And I found some people are a bit scared. They, they're, they're like, oh God, I just move in and I'm already old and uh, I'm not gonna be able to put in that much. And then I need, I'm gonna need so much help. You know, the, so they feel this imbalance and they, they're a bit scared about that because it's not established yet. I will also add that problem comes up when you talk about people with disabilities joining a community because yeah. the idea of intentional communities has always been, oh, you're coming to put some work in. 
but yeah. there are some people who have disabilities and they will always need to be cared for yes. their entire life and intentional communities in general have not been set up that way so yeah. you know and has done a lot of research with Camp Hill. So those communities are specifically created to, you know, have a support person to help that person with disabilities throughout their entire life. Yeah. But most intentional communities are not set up that way and don't have any way to support people who have need. Yeah. Thank you. Our next question comes from Seamus, which is what can be done in a community where people with more social capital use the presence of token community members to infer that there is no issue with inclusivity? So my suggestion is always to ask the token members what's going on with them. And can I, I brought my book. <laughs> so I wrote a book kind of from the perspective of a token and, you know, these people are you know tokens or somebody who's one of the only of a group you know they're coming into community knowing that they're one of the only and knowing that there might be some extra stress related to their identity but it is not appropriate for the people in the majority to say oh that person is getting along fine because that person may not be getting along fine they may be experiencing microaggressions and conflicts you know, that may or may not be related to their identity, but when you think of the whole context of it, somebody with a marginalized identity is dealing with higher level of stress. And then when you put that into community, there's a lot to be worked out. And so I would say to any community that's thinking about this, what are those people saying? And, you know, you have to do it in a way that helps those people to feel safe and comfortable actually saying it because otherwise you're never gonna hear it until they're out of the community, they have completely gone. Mm -hmm. Maria, do you have anything in response in your, in your research that reflects that? And no, I find that really interesting what Crystal's saying, but that was not my focus of study, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Our next question is from Stuart. Um, he, they say, I've studied leavers of new or non-traditional religious communities. What did you find specifically directed at Maria among your couples separating? Does this lead to one or the other leaving? And if so, was there a gender difference? Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, my, as well, I don't have quantitative data on that. I don't know the numbers. But my impression is um, it is uh, easier for the fathers to leave the community. And this is what happens a lot, I find, because there's, uh, there are a little bit more women in, co in communities than men. Maybe that's why. And um, uh, what, was the, what, what was the second part of the question? Did this lead to one or the other in, in a partnership leaving? And if so, was there a gender difference? Okay, so yeah, that, then I answered that. And I've, I've, I found that men feel, and even women feel thankful. They feel thankful to be, to be able to be in the community. Uh, what I said, they feel safe there. And men also felt good. The fathers also felt good because they felt yeah, they in a good place. I, I pay, I go there when I have time and, and, and do the climbing and uh, that's, that's, that's all fine. And they were happy with it. Both were happy with it. And, and again, the traditional roles are uh, solidified. Thank you. And thank you for your question, everyone. Um, questions, everyone. I am going to call Dan back onto the screen as he has a question for Crystal and Maria and to our, our attendees. We do have some extra time. So if you have any final questions or comments, please go ahead and put that into the Q&A because we do have a little time to address them. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you both um, for your really important analyses. It seems like the communities we've been talking about share a tendency to put emotional openness in the foreground and structures of power in the deep background. And that makes me kind of curious about communities where the opposite might be the case, communities that are built around changing structures of power and whether they may be vulnerable to some of the same challenges if they don't give equal attention to the emotional openness piece. And I don't, I don't know if you've seen um, the memoir by Alexandra Stein, Inside Out, which is about her experience in, in a Maoist community where everything was about 
putting each person into a particular pigeonhole as privileged or oppressed and everything kind of flowed from there in a manner that was quite coercive. So I wonder if you've experienced communities that start with the structures and what dynamics you've seen there. Well, I, I think they all want to be uh, democratic uh, and with sociocratically organized. They want to uh, build a dis the decision making on consent rather than majority vote. And um, they want everybody to be seen. They do all these practices, these workshops, a the forum and uh, all that. Um, but for some reason, if you don't really consciously want to change your, your, your behavior, yeah, uh, your gender specific behavior, which is deep in your DNA, if you don't consciously want to change it, it will always find like like water. It will always find ways to come up again. That's my impression. And you want you have say, to want I, to change. Yeah, I have been working with one group that is trying to address that in a really explicit way. So um, the Foundation for Intentional Community created a group called the BIPOC Fund last year and so um we have this what we call the bipoc council um and this council is um specifically trying to create intentional communities that are centered around the needs of bipoc and to you know give money to communities to give resources to those communities and we have we have definitely formed kind of not just an egalitarian democratic you know, structure, but it's also a structure recognizing that we want BIPOC to hold the power. So that means limiting the voices of white people and, and how they're interacting with the council. And so that really does lead to very explicit kind of like, here's the line of, of how much you, you can interact with us and, and control our policies and our ideas and our initiatives, you know, and that's going to also come into play when we're applying for grants and, you know, other types of money from investors, you know, we want our money to come from a source of empowering BIPOC and not just us begging for money from rich white people. So yeah, there's definitely exciting work that we're doing there. Thank Maybe you. I can Thank add you. something. Sorry. Sure. I just wanted to add, um, I didn't study that either, but that was my impression. My, I interviewed people who were in the mid or late uh, 30s and mid 50s, in this age range. I think the younger people coming up, they're different. I think there's more a gender openness, more gender fluidity, more playfulness with the gender roles. Um, and uh, I think um, there's a change probably happening, but that's just a, maybe it's just a hope. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Dan, for the question. Thank you, Kristen, Crystal and Maria for such, um, interesting and really thought provoking answers. So um, we do have another question from our audience from Stuart, which is Maria, you said you found six types of separation. Could you discuss those please? All right. <laughs> so it's, uh, I, oh God, yeah, I don't wanna, uh, I, 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 to put it briefly. Um, I found six types of separation. Um, one was like very where equality was from the very beginning the main focus and then they re-traditionalized when the first child was born and that was reason to split up and then the separation was the solution to come back to equality so that was quite interesting then i had a high conflict type and then i had four types with very emotionalized gender concepts and these these four types i found uh, in um, intentional communities, but not only. And uh, I also found, because now I was only talking about this very traditional uh, uh, concept of relationship, partnership, but I also found within this traditional concept, uh, mothers who were really, I called it this type devaluating, because they really devaluated their ex-partners um, using the feminine, um, attribution of being uh, very empathic and very understanding. So they really analyzed their ex-partner, went deep into his childhood and could tell everything about him and then explain why he is completely useless in every way. So they really devalued their ex-partner in quite an impressive way. 
as a man, as a father, as like in every way. But they still they still wanted him to be in the life of the children because he was the father. But they used him a lot. You know, they instrumentalized instrumentalized uh, the, the, the father a lot. So just to show you, it's it's I'm not trying to to make this good or bad. So also uh, these um, gender specific characters can be uh, can be also used in a toxic way on the feminine side. And maybe if I can add one more thing, which a, a, a separation type, which I only found in intentional communities, was a, a, um, partners who really merged into it, each other like a like a symbiosis. They were completely into this uh, sustainable living, and they dedicated their whole life to that, and became one unit. And it kind of was not important who did what because it was all for this one purpose. And when they split up it obviously became very difficult for a long time because they really had to kind of get out of this unity which is become individuals again uh, but then they managed to do a shared part, uh, parenthood afterwards um, yeah in a way they were happy with thank you maria crystal mm -hmm. did you find anything in, uh, similar in your research in, uh, I know you're, you weren't specifically or don't specifically study uh, separation, but I'm curious in the communities that you've studied if there is a similar way of approaching separation. Um, I think what I've seen is, is kind of what Maria was saying in that, you know, there's, there's some absorbing of, you know, some of the responsibilities or, or at least the idea that the, the mother and the child can kind of like stay in the community and be okay and that the, the men folk will, will also will be able to move on and, and do whatever they want. Um, no, but I haven't like, I haven't really talked to a lot of people about kind of the, the separation or what happens when, when families are kind of broken apart. Um, because a lot of the communities I've been involved with are non-monogamous, there's definitely uh, the drama and the, the difficulties associated with non-monogamy in general, which is kind of like a relationships breaking down and then people picking sides and then kind of conflict there. So that's what I've seen. Um, and that, you know, is, is work through the same way that other kind of conflicts are worked through, usually with nonviolent communication. Got it. Thank you so much, Crystal. So we have a question from Jeffrey, which is many intentional communities seem to attract people by presenting themselves as having figured it out and being unique in their opposition to the status quo. Could you speak to ways communities can increase humility and fluidity of process without losing the draw, losing the draw that people will have to going into a special community with a unique insight. Crystal, can you start? Because I really did, I did not quite get the question. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, um, so the question was kind of about mm -hmm. communities being really special and unique mm -hmm. and, and how do communities recognize that they're not special and unique? <laughs> so, so I always want to communicate to communities that they think they're doing something super progressive and different, but they still, if they haven't examined all those things that they're bringing into it, then it's going to be exactly the same structures that they're replicating, you know, from the outside world. So how to, um, how to increase humility. Um, I think just, you know, part of, part of my job is to, to help them understand that they, they have those things that are, that haven't been brought up that other people are seeing, but they as a community are not seeing. And definitely having a community that's open to visitors and open to people, um, to new people coming into the community is a way to kind of keep that fresh. Because when you do have new people, they're recognizing things that the, you know, the older community members haven't really thought of. And, and that can kind of help um, push communities forward. Yeah. OK, yeah. Yeah, as I said, I, I think. Um, they should focus less on this spirituality and more on have a practical approach on how do we live who, who how do we divide the work and how do we create equal chances for everybody to do a, a soft skill and hard skills to do the family work this the 
relationship building and to do the hands-on work. And both genders should be involved in the same way. And I think um, this is something um, that cannot be done voluntarily, I, I'm afraid. <laughs> I think it, it needs to be somehow, it needs to be, we, we're going to do this. Yeah, it has to be done. Otherwise, we're not going to change the inequality. Well said, both of you. Thank you so much. Um, so I think our final question, unless we have anyone else who's gonna who has something brewing that they'd like to like to present to our panelists today, is from Sue Ro. And the question is: I thought specific gender has genetically, as Maria mentioned, already set ability such as female. Okay, so let me let me think through this for a second. It seems like gender inequality in the sense of traditional gender roles seems to be very difficult to be changed. What are some practical ways in which that inequality could be either already is being changed within the communities that you've seen, especially for you, Crystal, in spaces that have been open to non-binary and trans members uh, joining their communities. And Maria, you mentioned that in the communities you've studied, there's been pretty specifically people who identify as male, and people who identify as female, and very heteronormative relationships. Um, so I'm curious how those, that sense of traditional gender role, how are some ways, practical ways, um, besides just examining it how what are some ways which that could be shifted or adjusted yeah i have a strong reaction to the idea that because a woman has a child that you know she is somehow more responsible for the child so you know i think the genetics of it aren't really um in fact in up in, you know they aren't in play because we're not animals who just do what our genetics tell us to do. You know, we have the ability to examine these structures and uh, a male parent can participate in the upbringing of a child from birth, just like a female parent can. So I think when we think about gender equality, we have to move away from the idea that somebody is, is meant for this role. And also, you know, now that we do have this gender non-conforming thing, you know, there are people who identify as male who have a uterus and who can have a child. And so does that mean that, you know, they have to be the one that stays home with the, with the child? Or can we re-examine those roles and do what works best for each person instead of what their genitals are telling us they should do? Thank you, Crystal. Excellent response. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Maria? Yeah, I would like to add, if you look at what we know about separation, if you look at the research, we see this financial struggle for women after, like in a nutshell, after divorce and a social struggle for men. Yeah, they feel left out, they feel abandoned, they feel alone and all the rest of it. And women feel overwhelmed by the work and blah, blah, blah. So this is, this is what we know. And di divorce and separation is, is a normality nowadays. So why don't we consider this when we start a family and just say, okay, let's live in a way and let's organize our family in a way that we can separate and nobody's going to be disadvantaged. And I think that would solve so many problems. Yeah, that's really helpful. The idea of family planning with separation as a part of that. Family. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And community planning then at large. In these yes, ways. exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Okay, so really quickly, <laughs> we have one last question from Beth, which was agree with the answer to the above question. Thank you, Crystal. Um, also, who are the male-bodied folks working on these challenges within intentional communities? And uh, if there aren't many who identify as men, will things really change? Yeah, that's a tough one. You know, there are leaders within the intentional communities movement who are really taking on this idea of diversity and, and trying to change power dynamics. Um, do, the, do any of them identify as men? I don't know. Um, Sky Blue used to be the director of the Foundation for Intentional Community, and they have always used kind of their role as a leader of the movement and as part of this nonprofit organization to encourage communities to think about these gender dynamics. And so I think Sky's work is probably the most relevant. Thank you, Crystal. Maria, do you have anything to add? No. 
Thanks, Mindo. Lots of this one. Wonderful. Well, these were such wonderful responses. Thank you, Crystal and Maria, so much. And thank you to our attendees, to our audience for joining us today. Um, we encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter for more information on future events, including upcoming colloquia and information on our inaugural conference on ecological spiritualities in April 2022. You can find more information about the colloquia as well as the conference um, on, our, on our website. Crystal today has suggested some information and resources for those of you who would like to follow up on some of the topics we covered today. I'm gonna go ahead and pop those into the chat. And thank you, Crystal, so much for sharing these. And it was just so, so interesting to hear about your work today, both of you, thank you. Thank you too. Thank you for the interesting questions. Yes, for sure. Thank you mm -hmm. to your uh, audience as well. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much again. Wishing you all health and safety in these complicated times. Um, and uh, we hope to see you next time. Please feel free to write at the um, PES at hds.harvard.edu if you have any follow up questions and uh, we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you again, Crystal and Maria, and hope to see you soon. Yeah. Sponsor Program for the Evolution of Spirituality. Copyright 2021, President and Fellows of Harvard College.